Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. We can dance, we can dance, everybody look at your hands. Oh, we can dance, we can dance, everybody's taking the chance. Save the dance, oh, let's save the dance. Yes, yeah, save the dance. Hello, and welcome to episode 228 of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is part two of a two-part interview with firefighter Perry Hall. Perry experienced a significant near-miss event which he shared the biggest part of in episode or part one of this uh, two-part episode. And now he's going to share the horrific consequences of post-traumatic stress following that near-miss event. But before I jump into the second part of this interview with Perry Hall, I have an announcement to make. We've got another sponsor for this show. From the beginning, Midwest Fire, an amazing fire apparatus manufacturer located in Minnesota, has been and remains our title sponsor, and we are so thankful for their continued support. Joining Midwest Fire now is Chief Miller. Chief Joel Miller has the world's largest first responder followership on Instagram, and he's putting out some massive amounts of content in his feed every day. Let's check it out. I am super excited to have Chief Miller on board as a sponsor of the SA Matters show. Head over to Instagram and follow him, Chief underscore Miller on Instagram. Okay, if you're new to the show, stick around after the featured segment to learn more about our mission, how you can attend or host a live event, and how to get connected with us on our social media feeds. All right, let's jump into our feature segment, part two of my interview with Near Miss Survivor, Perry Hall. Let me introduce you to Perry Hall. Perry Hall grew up in the fire service with his father in North Carolina. He went on to become a career firefighter in a large municipal department with 500 plus employees. With over 20 years in the fire service, both as a volunteer and paid firefighter holding various positions. Throughout his career, Perry obtained a number of certifications, a BA degree in fire administration, and is currently very involved as a fire rescue instructor. Perry is married and is a father of two children and four stepchildren. Perry's own cumulative exposure to a number of critical incidents made a huge impact on him personally. Perry encountered one final incident that dramatically changed his life and his career. Through his personal experience, he's begun educating himself and getting involved in mental health first aid, crisis intervention teams, and training on critical incident stress management to learn more about how critical incidents affect emergency responders, education that would help education that would have helped him earlier in his career. 
Currently, he is an advocate for first responders and works to educate others about the effects of trauma among first responders and how important mental wellness is for emergency responders. very bad situation and for somebody without the experience um it could have been very detrimental to them sure experience and training so um you go you get the you get some treatment and uh you're back to work a week later they do a they do a debrief talk about lessons mm -hmm. learned and you're back on the job so where does it go from here so yeah they um I went to light duty, you know, about a week uh, after the event. I was out a couple more, two, three more weeks. Um, I didn't have any, um, uh, no thought of any problems or issues or anything stemming from it. Things was back as normal. Uh, matter of fact, the first day I was back to the truck, I went and helped burn a house um, that morning, and it was you know, I had some friends that was asking me how you think you're going to, you know, it was the first time I've been in an air pack or in a fire environment since that day. Um, you know, I'm not going to, it, it did, um, I didn't, I don't know, it did, it was um, different that first time, I guess, being in that heated environment again, um, but it didn't deter me. Um, so um, things went on as normal at work. Um, so I thought, so, um, back to riding calls, you know, um, doing what I love to do. And, um, then things started snowballing from there. Um, noticing a lot of things, um, just a lot of changes in, in my, in my personal life, I guess, from there. Are you noticing them as they happen or it's only after the fact that you notice them? Yeah, it's only after the fact. Um, so Looking back, um, I see that um, I, was, I was having difficulty sleeping. Um, I had disassociated myself with everyone, um, with the exception of my children. Uh, I was uh, divorced at the time. Um, it was me and, and my son and daughter, and that are the only two people that I wanted to be with and wanted to be around. Um, of course, I wasn't mean or hateful or anybody to the guys at work, but um, – they did. They do mention now that they noticed that I was spending more time in my in my room, um, which is not like me. I'm usually out and about and doing everything with them. Um, so, um, yeah, I was having um, flashbacks or nightmares, thinking about things. Um, I was. I've always had depression my entire life, but I was having a lot of a um, lot more. I was a lot deeply depressed. Um, and then my drinking had uh, become more, more so. Uh, and with my drinking, it never happened at work or it never happened at firehouse and volunteer or anything else. But if I was at home, um, that's, I was drinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is um, all of these things are accumulating. Sure. Dissociation, trouble sleeping, flashbacks, nightmares, depression, drinking. Mm -hmm. This this doesn't seem to be on a a good trajectory here. So keep keep, keep, keep us keep so, us going on this. What what's happening? What 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 happens in this? Yeah. So and I'd also become um, very emotional about things. Um, I never second guess myself when I was on the fire truck you know when you're on the fire truck in this job or you're in the ambulance or in the police car you're in your element that's what you do that's what you love to do and uh, I never had any um, you know, I was operating to my fullest in them times when I was at home was my problem 
So when I left the firehouse, I was by myself, except for when I had my children, um, which it was a 50-50 deal with my ex-wife. So there was a lot of times I was by myself, uh, which is not a good combination for emergency responders in certain situations. Um, so I was drinking very heavily, um, very, very depressed. And I had gotten to a point um, that, and now looking back at that, and all the education and the treatment I've had, I was using that alcohol to push those feelings and emotions and stuff farther and farther down to where, um, you know, I didn't have to deal with them. So I thought being pushed down. Um, so is this impacting your, your work at all? Are you no, missing no. work or coming in hungover or – um, is it affecting, you know, your work judgment or anything like that, that you could, sure. looking back, I mean, at the yeah. moment, I would expect that you would not have seen it then, but looking back that it wasn't. Yeah, no, it never really, um, the guys at work didn't notice. The only thing they really noticed anything about was, like I said, I'd spend more time in my room. Um, but, uh, no, I didn't come in hungover. Um, uh, I was, I wasn't calling out, um, you know, everything stayed in the, in the time off. Um, I didn't bring it. Obviously, it was coming to work with me, not the alcohol, but the feelings and emotions and all that. But I was in my element, you know, on that fire truck. That's what I love to do um, with my crew. You know, I love my crew. They were my second family. And um, uh, so, yeah, it was um, I, almost in a way when I was at work, that was my my good time, I guess if that makes sense, because you're in your element. You're not by yourself. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Your mind's not running. Your mind's thinking about fire stuff, and it's not thinking about, you know, um, personal issues. What, what's your shift like? Is it 24-48, or how, how does yes, it shift run? There at, Green, at Greensboro, it was 24-48, and then uh, here at High Point, they do the modified. But, uh, yeah, 24-48 there. Okay. So you had 48 off to Mm -hmm. go into your state of all of these things occurring to you. Sure. Um, hmm. All right. So how long, how long do you stay on this track? I was in in that for, for a good while. And then, um, what's a good while we we talking weeks or months? Well, within that, um, well, it was kind of hit and go. So that worked up to May 27th where um, I was by myself. Um, I was just excluded, uh, excluded to myself um, during all this time. But it, it, I'd got to the point where I was lonely too, meaning that I didn't have my kids. They were with, my, with their mother at the time during that two days. Um, and I had become very depressed. and. Um, I was reached out to a friend and I'd been drinking and I made a very alcohol induced, um, depressed, not myself decision, um, to, to get in a vehicle and drive to my friend's house. Um, cause I was so, I was really hitting the bottom, bottom of my, my barrel there. Um, so when I did that, um, heading to my friend's house, I was eventually pulled over and charged with a, a DWI um, that evening. Um, the law enforcement was, I mean, I remember the whole thing. It wasn't like I was blacked out. I never, and to mention, I never really drank myself any time to black out stage. Um, but um, I drank very heavily, and I think the reason I didn't get to blackout stage is because my body had become so accustomed to it. Um, but I was pulled over and I was charged. The law enforcement with that agency in that county was very respectful and very nice. Um, they did all they could do to help me. Um, they really did. And I was um, released on a written promise to appear later on that evening. Okay. And uh, is that a wake up call or what happens next? It was. Um, I think I really started spiraling after that. So I got to the point after that to where I um, would spend time on end on the couch and do nothing. Um, I really um, got out of that was one of the times that I um, was able to become sober for a little bit um, until it grabbed hold of me again. 
But, um, yeah, I didn't recognize all this that had been bottling up, and now it was all presented in front of me. Um, you know, it was laying right there in front of me. So I didn't write all these feelings and emotions that was bottled up. So I was trying to process all this. Um, it was a lot to take on, take in. And I realized that I, I was in a very bad place, very distressed. Um, so I reached out to uh, employee assistance program, actually, um, to try and get some help. A lot of times when people are in this situation, they don't have – they're not so conscientious of the fact that they've reached that, that point, you know, and don't make, and they don't reach out. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, they're in the, I don't know, denial or just blind, yeah. blind to it. And I guess where I'd been in denial in the past, like where they tried to do interventions with me, I'd already kind of been through that road where I was somewhat in denial. So um, when this event occurred, I knew, I guess I'd already been down that path. So I knew I was to the to the bottom of the barrel. Okay. So you reach out to EAP and uh, they get you all fixed up? Well, so I reach out to them. I go to them. I'd actually utilized them a couple of times in the past um, over the years. And um, I reached out to them, I'll go in and speak with them and tell the whole story of what all had transpired. And um, So they pretty much, they listen to it and they say, well, you know, these, these are all natural feelings, uh, natural things that occur. And um, you just give it a little time and it'll pass. Um, so that's kind of what I was left with, with the EAP. Um, so with them, um, they're very educated doctors, very good at what they do. However, within the organization, if that EAP doctor is or therapist um, is not trained or work with emergency responders, it's a totally different atmosphere. It's totally different um thing and that's the that's what i came up against there so you you realize that that they as skilled as they are didn't have the tools to help you absolutely because you know you and looking at it now and thinking back you know i'm sitting here telling this this doctor um all these things about being trapped in it and, and i'm sure to them you know they can't even imagine or compare to that they don't you know, and I get that. I do. Um, you know, I imagine that's like, you know, being told how somebody's been shot at at war or something. Unless you can put yourself in that situation or you can relate to those individuals, you know, your hands are kind of tied. Mm -hmm. Um, so I seen from that point that, uh, where I knew that there was something wrong with me, I knew I needed help. Um, and I, one thing I don't think I've mentioned prior to 2014, when I started in the mid nineties, uh, um, I come on with Greensboro in 2000, but when I started in the fire service as a volunteer, uh, mid to late nineties, the, um, up until 2014, I had no education in, in, um, uh, mental health, well-being. Um, we didn't know anything. All we knew about was the EAP. That was it. So, I didn't know where to turn or what to do. I had no idea. Um, I knew, and I told and I talked with who I needed to talk with within the department, but I left it at that with the department because I didn't want, you know, in a way I was trying to keep things quiet, you know, uh, which is what a lot of times emergency responders do for whatever reason it may be reputation, promotion, career, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ripped around and I found a, there in town, a outpatient treatment facility, 40 hours outpatient. Uh, well, I went to a outpatient treatment facility and I was put in a program of 40 hours outpatient um, and was diagnosed there with post-traumatic stress. And I went through that program with uh, positive, positive uh, outcomes. Um, was still alcohol free at this point. Okay. So this was a local program in in the greensboro mm -hmm. area yes in the greensboro area huh okay so it it worked and it was helpful for you it was it was um and i thought you know again not having any education or i didn't know what i was doing um i was just trying to get help and it worked um 
But then I started taking, after that, I started taking a lot of classes, emergency responder related, like critical incident stress, uh, became SISM certified, uh, suicide prevention, uh, critical incident training, the list goes on and on. And through going through all of these, I found that um, I still needed much help. And um, with this, I also had, again, thinking that I could handle it, I had started drinking some again and um not if not at work or anything but back at home and um i had i had um a, approached the problem but not knowing what i needed to do the problem was still there um unresolved if that makes sense so you, when you're taking these classes on critical incident stress management and stuff is that to learn more about your situation or to be a person to help others? I was trying, you know, I thought that um, I was um, better or well, I guess you should say. Uh, and I was actually taking them to try and help others. Yeah. So did you feel any sense of, of um, I don't know what the word would be, um, guilt maybe that – you're out there trying to help others, but you know that you're not exactly where you need to be yourself. Is this, is this all starting to come to light? Yeah. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help these people. And when I go home and I look in the mirror, I see this person who probably needs as much help as those I'm trying to help. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually had a relation. Um, I could relate to some of the calls we were going on, you know, um, for example, you know, with the post-traumatic stress and depression and stuff like that, it's a it's a term mental illness. Well, and I use these in my classes that I do when we're dispatched on a, a psychiatric call or a suicide attempt or something. You know, the first thing that goes in emergency responders' mind is, well, these people are crazy. Well, I'm actually in that boat now. Um, so in the back of my mind, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, they're talking about these folks so the stigma is so big the stigma and the terminology i think the terminology really hurts i don't like the word mental ill or mental illness or mental health because i think that scares people um, especially emergency responders real expectations because that's what matters know your limit know your partner's limit because that's what matters Assumptions are bad. SA matters. Proper PPE is important because SA matters. Flawed situational awareness is a really big deal. SA matters. Know your water supply because SA matters. Bears and cougars, SA matters. Go versus no go because SA matters. Confidence is good. Overconfidence is bad. SA matters. Buddies matter, because SA matters. SA matters, so don't get angry. When the pigs are eating lemons, SA matters. Our academy class is going home today because we know that SA matters. Did you feel any sense of, of um, I don't know what the word would be, um, guilt maybe that you're out there trying to help others, but you know that you're not exactly where you need to be yourself? Is this is this all starting to come to light? Yeah. You see, I'm 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 trying to help these people, and when I go home and I look in the mirror, I see this person who probably needs as much help as those I'm trying to help. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually had a relation. Um, I could relate to some of the calls we were going on, you know, um, for example, you know, with the post-traumatic stress and depression and stuff like that, it's a, it's a term mental illness. Well, and I use these in my classes that I do when we're dispatched on a, a psychiatric call or a suicide attempt or something, you know, the first thing that goes in emergency responders mind is, well, these people are crazy. Well, I'm actually in that boat now um so in the back of my mind i'm you know i'm thinking you know i'm they're talking about these folks so the stigma 
is so big. The stigma and the terminology. I think the terminology really hurts. I don't like the word mental Ill- or mental illness or mental health because I think that scares people, um, especially emergency responders. So, um, is there a better, is there a better term? I try to use mental wellness or, um, I, I really don't know what the right term is. I think the mental, um, mental health in emergency services, we so much relate that to, um, the mental health we go and deal with in the field, which is the same, but a lot of, they relate that to crazy, you know, psychological, um, so, I, you know, all that comes into play, and I think that scares people. And it and it don't scare me, but I don't like the terminology of it. Um, the mental well-being is what I try to use. Okay. Um, but, um, so, yeah, I had gotten to this point, um, and I was trying – I was doing the best I could for my children. Um, and um, I, I will say, too, at this point – and in the past, but at this point um, – I was hiding my drinking and I thought I was hiding it. Um, and I actually was hide. I hid it pretty good for a long time, but when you think, and as emergency responders, I know a lot of people out there are like me, um, when they're trying to hide, when they know they're drinking too much and they're trying to hide that overindulgence, people do see it. Um, your family does recognize it. And, uh, even though they may not say something, they do see it. So, um, you're really not fooling people. I wasn't fooling people like I thought I was. Mm-hmm. So you're back to drinking. Mm-hmm. Still not quite where you <clears throat> are managing your post-traumatic stress. Where does it go from here? Yeah, so I was managing it. Um, <clears throat> and through all this, I could see that the 40 hour program that I went through, um, again, it was good. It was good, but it didn't hit any of the emergency responder attributes that goes along with the job. Um, kind of like the EAP, it's totally different. You know, emergency responders are a different breed. Um, so I knew I needed something. I knew I needed some extra help that I wasn't getting. Uh, and I actually searched for months and months um, for some type of treatment facility um, and uh, for emergency responders or something that would work for me. Uh, and there's a couple of things that were out there. I actually got accepted into one um, out on the East Coast, um, Florida, I believe it was. And then I found this other one, uh, Onsite Academy in uh, Westminster, Massachusetts. And... Um, they deal only with first responders and military. They deal nothing with the public. They are all post or some are still emergency responders. Um, it is a residential program. So I got accepted there. Um, they don't deal with insurance um, because a lot of places insurance is just a problem, um, but they don't turn anybody away. So they worry about payment later. If you need help, you come up there. So it's for post-traumatic stress, substance abuse, anything like that they handle. Um, So I was accepted into there. Um, Prior into doing that, though, um, I had gotten to a point where um, I was so depressed. um, I was laying on the couch. I even went through a little old, I wasn't drinking. I was just, all I did was lay on the couch. I had no energy. Um, I did, I did stuff with my children and when I had my children, you know, that's what I love to do. Um, but outside of that, I did nothing. Um, I had become so depressed. Now I will say, um, thankfully I never was suicidal. I never, suicide never crossed my mind. Um, I don't know why it didn't, but I'm glad it didn't. Um, the, um, I had got to where I was just laying there and it had gotten to the point where I eventually actually resigned um, from my dream job as as a younger age of Greensboro fire department. And I separated, um, separated with the department. Um, And then I got to where I just laid on the couch um, for hours and hours. And at this time too um, is when I met my current, my my wife now that I'm very blessed with that I really believe the good Lord sent to me in my my biggest time of need there 
um, without her, truly without her and my family and my children and the good Lord, I, I don't know where I'd be today. So that's kind of up to the point um, that I was before I went to treatment. Okay, so you found this place on on site academy in Westminster, Mass, mm-hmm. and uh, you contacted them, and they they agreed to take you on. They did, yeah. So the way they work, um, you you contact them, you speak with somebody, and then they they do a um, uh, intake on the phone. They they like to do it in person, um, but if you don't live in the area there, um, you do it on the line. So they've had people from the um, southeast before. Um, they have came there. So we did all the intake stuff. Um, they took me right on. Um, I set up a day to come up, which wasn't, but, um, I think a couple weeks later from the intake, um, and I set up my flights. I had somebody there to pick me up out of Boston and take me to the, it was out in the rural area. Very pretty. Um, I was very, very nervous and it was actually one of the hardest or if one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, uh, was to leave my family. Um, it was very, very difficult. How long was this going to program going to last? Did you have any idea when you went there? Um, no. So they do, they give recommendation and then, um, but they don't make anybody leave. So for example, somebody may, um, work through the program and work through everything there, but, um, may have some concerns. Don't think they could stay clean or sober if they went home and was around a certain family member. So they allow them to stay as long as they need, um, which is it's a very awesome thing. Um, now, the first time your um, firefighter buddies tried to get you some help, mm-hmm. um, your concern about being away from your family caused you to deny their offering to get you some assistance. So what changed here that you were now willing to leave your family? Had you yeah. Had you reached the you know, the, the dire straits, so to speak. Yeah. I think I I knew that if something didn't give, if if I didn't give or if something didn't change itself, I, something, I either, I was going to, uh, end up dead or, um, I was going to do something, um, to the effects I was going to end up in, in, in jail or whatever. I was to the dead end, um, where something had to absolutely give. And I truly didn't know what the future was going to hold for me. I was to the bottom. Um, when I left Greensboro, um, and I actually left the volunteer organizations, I got totally out and I, I thought hard and long, uh, of not going back. Um, I had gotten to that point of, uh, of, uh, despair, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they agree to take you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I'm, I don't know if I want to ask you the, any details about or that you would want to talk about any details about how they helped you. So I'll, I'll leave that open-ended and have you share as much or as little as you would, sure. as you would want to. Yeah. So this was really the first time that other than the classes I had been taking, um, you know, prior to on the, on the SISM and suicide prevention and stuff that I really was, was shown the signs and symptoms of certain things, how, how emergency responders were different from the public was in there. So that we did a lot of sessions on really making, you know, that it's okay not to be okay, that you're having a, a normal reaction to an abnormal event or accumulation of events. You know, what we see and what we do in all aspects of emergency services and, uh, military is not normal. The general public cannot fathom um, what what somebody may see in a given day um, or even before lunch one day. So we did a lot of sessions on those things and uh, we actually we wrote up a, a plan too for ourselves of you know this is with their assistance. This is where we are now. This is what we can do to help ourselves and this is where we want to be in the future. Um, so they also work depending on, well, everybody did it together. They did the uh, NA there, um, which it goes hand in hand with Alcohols Anonymous. So um, you did do your AA or your NA um, while you were there. Um, they had the meetings in there where people came in, past members of the, of the group, 
Um, they did um, group discussions, anger management, um, family developmental skills. They also did um, group cooking. So it was a lot like the firehouse. Um, so you cooked as a group. Um, you uh, still could have your cell phone, um, which was very, very important to me. Um, that was why some reasons I didn't go to some places because the one that I didn't go to that my, uh, my co-workers was trying to get me to, I couldn't have contact with my family and um, I had to have contact with my children. It's hard enough for me to leave, but um, if I couldn't have contact, I wouldn't have went. Um, you had internet access. Um, so they trusted you, um, which was very big. Um, they did massages, uh, ac acupuncture, um, the debriefings, one-on-one -on -one counseling. And I also did the uh, EMDR or the uh, eye movement um, desensitization and processing um, to kind of work through the events that had occurred. Yeah, t let's, uh, if, you, if you would be willing to, just to spend a little time with EMDR because you're not the first responder, that, the first first responder that I've talked to um, about um, getting access to this form of treatment, which at the time it was explained to me had not received any form of FDA approval and therefore was considered to be a controversial treatment mm -hmm. of post-traumatic stress for, for military and first yeah. responders. So what's your, uh, what's your take on the EMDR concept and, and, and was it helpful for you? Yeah. So um, I'd never heard of it before this. Um, and actually a lot of stuff was brand new to me here. Um, but that was, I had never heard of that. Well, I take that back when, when we were doing the intake and up to come and they mentioned that that was something that, that you could do. But other than that, I had no knowledge of it. Um, so it did come through the military um, as a lot of things in emergency services that come up through the military. Um, it had proven to be very, um, very successful for them. Um, and they have since a lot of these um, treatment facilities and um, for emergency responders, uh, therapists and such are using this as a, as a tool for um, emergency responders. Now you had the option to, um, to use it or not to use it here. You didn't have to, but I figured what, you know, it, what's it going to hurt? So the way it was, it, this, the way it was explained to me, um, is that your brain is kind of like a, a filing cabinet. So every, everything we do throughout the day is filed away. So you don't forget it. It's just filed away and it's sitting there. Well, when somebody has or experiences a traumatic event, that event doesn't get filed anywhere. So that's why you're continuously re-experiencing, rethinking. You can't never get your mind off of it because um, it's just bouncing around in your mind constantly. It's not filed away. So this EMDR, the way it was explained to me and the process that we went through, they put you in a deep, uh, almost like a, a hypnotic type um, um, state. Um, and then they ask you questions and you relive the entire event. Um, you're still, you're conscious, you remember everything. Um, so it, it's kind of a strange feeling, I guess you could say, but we go through this, you go through the entire story and then um, they'll ask you questions. And then when the event is over, sometimes one time is enough for somebody. Sometimes it takes several sessions of the EMDR. The hope and the plan is, and the success is very great um, that that is filed away in the filing cabinet, not to where you forget it or that you remember this, forget the smells or the thoughts, but that you can live with it and live a progressive life. Um, it, ju it just doesn't as freely come into consciousness as when it's not filed away. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it's medication free. It's, you know, it's all that stuff is just the, the processing. And if it doesn't work for somebody, um, that's okay. There's other things that are out there, but it's just another great tool um, that work, did work, um, did work great for me. So I still remember everything about the events, um, you know, very, very vividly, um, but I'm able to process and, and live with it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you went through EMDR, were, were you addressing just this incident from May 5th, or did you 
actually go through and address some other incidents from from previous in your career? Yes, yeah, so they did the one on um, on this event, and then they did some additional on the other events as well um, that they would ask you about. Um, so if somebody went in, I guess the one thing I would say is you have to be completely honest, not only with yourself, but with the processes that you're going through, because if you're not, um, it's not going to work. Um, mm-hmm. So you have to be completely open and honest um, with, with yourself, number one, and then with the process. Mm-hmm. And how long did you spend at that facility? Um, that that facility there, I spent uh, 14 days, uh, and then we did much um, after care as well. So once I got home, I continued, um, but um, just at home. And I was still in contact with them, too. They'd call, they still call me to this day and check up with you and, and such like that. Okay. Uh, and uh, so when, uh, in the time frame of things, what, did you go there in 2014, the same year that the event had happened, or was it sometime after that? Yeah, it was sometime after that. I actually went there in uh, 2015. Okay. Late 2015, yeah. Okay. And uh, so you had – you had been dealing with this for quite a while before you went to that facility. Yes. Yes, sir. And, and, you know, again, I, I didn't have any, I had lots of people that reach out and want to help and help, but there wasn't in our area, there wasn't really much knowledge or education of things. It wasn't talked about mm-hmm. um, since things have really blossomed, which is wonderful uh, in the state um, still has a long way to go but we have to start somewhere. So, uh, but then, yeah, we had, I had nowhere to start that I knew of. All right. So much like the event of May 5th, I, at the end of that story, I asked you to talk about the lessons learned that you were your takeaways on how to be better and safer as a firefighter um, from that particular near miss event. I'm going to categorize this that happened to you afterwards is yet another near miss event because the circumstances were just slightly different your outcome could have been a could have been catastrophic so from this near miss what lessons would you want to share with others sure yeah um Remember, it's so important for everybody to, to remember that you have a breaking point. Everybody has a breaking point. Um, hopefully, you never reach it. Um, most probably never will reach their breaking point. But everybody has one. And this close call was mine, was my breaking point. Um, all these other critical incidents through the years prior that had accumulated um, and just been pushed down and pushed down. And, um, you know, I was using alcohol as my coping medicine, my coping mechanism. Um, the, the key to all this is pre-education. We have to get our folks pre-educated um, and constant or periodically continuing education on this stuff. It needs to become like it's second nature where people are, are not hesitant to reach out for help. Um, confidentiality being the key of that. So. Um, yeah, I already spoke that I didn't have any prior knowledge or education prior to this. Um, but I didn't, and most are the same, but I didn't prior to this event have a true understanding of myself and how I would react in certain situations until that time occurred. For example, the past device. You know, I trained and I teach it for years all across the state, but I didn't use it. It never crossed my mind. Um, but it's impossible to put yourself in somebody else's shoes until you experience it. So like the Monday morning quarterbacks, um, the stuff you see all over social media, um, in a way that is influencing the stigma around mental health because people are being, or mental wellness because people are being reluctant to speak up because they're afraid they're going to be blackballed or ridiculed. Now that has gotten a lot better over the years, but we have to make people feel open to speak when they need assistance. Um, also remembering what isn't a significant event to you may very well be to someone else. Let's say it's a run of the mill CPR that we run every day, an elderly female, 
Well, to you, it may be just a normal call, but to the other person on the truck, it may remind them of their grandmother that passed away two weeks ago or whatever. The, you don't know how things are going to affect somebody. Um, one other thing to really, to really keep in mind is one responder may respond positively to immediately discussing something after the fact. So let's say a close call, um, a critical incident, having a defusing or a, a debriefing immediately after, and there needs to be one, but everybody's not going to speak up in that time. And that's okay. I'm not one to speak up immediately. I, if we'd have had a defusing immediately after that fire, I probably wouldn't have spoke up other than to tell what went on that day, not to get into my feelings or anything. So we can't force anybody to talk until they're ready. The first time somebody is, is pressured into talking, they're going to shut down and they're not going to talk at all. So it's very important that you let them know that you care, that you're there, you have resources, but don't push them. You'd be very surprised at who comes to you then a day, two weeks down the road um, to reach out for assistance. Yeah. So um, out there is going to be somebody who's listening or watching to this and thinking they have a friend who needs help. What's the best approach for them to help somebody? I mean, you could say, you know, if you, if you want to talk, I'm here. But if they never call, but you still don't see them you yeah. know, get any better. Sure. What, what's, what's the way to throw the life preserver and, you know, pull them in and, and, and help them if they're not really thinking or seeing that they need the help or they're just flat out denying any help that someone would ask, offer to them. Sure. Yeah, I think with any of this type of stuff, confidentiality is, uh, is number one. Somebody is not going to open up or ask for help or come to you unless um, the program, if you have such a program in place or you as an individual, is not confidential. That um, Now, there are certain times when you have to break that confidentiality, um, suicidal um, or danger to others, possible danger. Now, if that's the case and you're going to break it, you need to explain that to them. Look, I'm worried about you. Um, we need to get you some help for the suicidal thoughts. Um, but reaching out to them, um, again, it's kind of a fine line. It, it, it's um, Because if we pressure somebody too much, they're going to shut down and they're not going to reach out and get that assistance. Um, but you just knowing that you're there. Um, so, for example, I may speak with somebody today. You know, oftentimes I get, well, let me think about it, and I'll get back with you in a couple of days. But if I don't hear from them that day, that next day, instead of calling them, I may just send them a text. Say, hey, I'm just checking in with you. I'm seeing how you're doing if you need anything. I find doing things like that, you build that relationship, and they know, hey, this guy really cares. This, this guy is really reaching out to me, um, you know, and, and having, letting him know that it's okay not to be okay. Again, doing what we do is not normal. Um, the statistics within emergency responders is just so, so scary. So every 1.4 days, statistically, we're losing an emergency responder to suicide. Um, and my outlook on suicide has changed. You know, these folks have just gotten to the bottom of the barrel where they feel that they are um, doing what's best for their family and for them. Um, we got to get in front of these folks and, and offer them this help. Alcohol abuse. You know, we watch TV or you read a magazine, you watch these TV shows. If they're not in the firehouse or in the police car, they're in a bar. You know, it's common. It is common protocol that that is what we do. We drink. Well, for the general public, alcohol abuse is about 79% of the general public has alcohol abuse. Emergency responders is 25 to 30%. So it's huge, huge what we're doing. So just speaking with them, hey, you know, um, do you think, you know, what, what's going on with the alcohol, you know, um, or inviting them to go do things that doesn't involve alcohol, you know, showing them, Hey, we can have fun without using the alcohol, little things like that. Um, really, really goes places, um, with somebody really, really assists them. 
So what are you doing these days to try to spread the word? Well, I started um, after treatment and everything. Um, I really didn't talk about things for some time. Um, I was embarrassed, kind of um, ashamed of what I had caused for myself. Um, and then whatever reason, I, things turned for me. Um, and I got, you know, if I, if I can share my story with one person and it helps them and prevent somebody from going down the road I did or prevent their family from going through the hell that I put my family through, um, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. And, um, so I started sharing my story, anybody that would listen, um, I've, I've got several articles that I have written on things. And I'm very, very honest about, I don't hide anything. I'm very honest about everything of my past. And the, and the reason for that is if somebody can connect with one thing I say, they may say, Hey, you know, I thought I was alone in this, this guy hid went and hid behind his camper while camping with his family to drink. Um, so he could feel normal. So I felt normal. I only felt normal when I was on the fire truck or when I was drinking. I didn't feel normal otherwise. Um, so I started sharing my story. Um, I was writing articles. Um, and then I become involved in a North Carolina peer support team, which um, online is North Carolina firefighter peer support team, the way it was, um, the way it was set up. But now we've taken the firefighter out because it's for uh, all emergency services, um, fire, police, EMS, telecommunications um and i'm very very i'm on the leadership team with them it goes across the state of north carolina um, we do pre-education we'll go and talk with anybody that will listen um, we have a very aggressive um, website um, we do we mirror a lot of what illinois peer support team does and it is um just to help and try and provide ongoing emotional uh, wellness resources um, for emergency responders. We try to be a friend. We're totally confidential. We try to be a friend to that individual. Sometimes people just want to talk. They need somebody to talk to that they know is confidential, or they may need resources for alcohol, or they may need resources for suicidal thoughts. Um, so we have a 1-800, or it's not a 1-800. It is a toll-free number that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it goes to um, us leadership staff. And um, we obtain whatever they need that they're looking for at that time. Now, are you, are you teaching classes then now too on this? I am, yes. Um, so we do, um, uh, with the pre-education part, um, signs and symptoms of critical incident stress, um, what some critical incidents may be, um, resources that are available to them. A lot of people don't realize uh, the resources that are available for such things, free resources, 24 hours a day. Um, not only that, but we also look at the family portion of it. What, what do we need to do to support the families? Um, you know, it's statistically proven now that somebody that is living through these traumatic events going home, um, family members are developing uh, post-traumatic stress just from living with this individual. So caring for these these um, uh, these family members. Also having clinicians and therapists building resource lists of those that are have experience and are willing to work with emergency responders. So important. Okay, if somebody wanted to uh, to locate you to talk with you more about your experience, what happened, how, what advice you could offer to them, just being somebody that would be there to support them, or they want to host a class and have you come in and do it. How does somebody find you? Okay, yeah, it's uh, F P Hall H A L L one four zero at Gmail. Is there anything that we, uh, on, on either near miss event, the first or this mm -hmm. second, is there anything that we need to say that I haven't been able to um, bring into the conversation with the questioning that I've asked? Have we left anything untouched? I don't think so. It's been a good overall uh, umbrella of everything. Um, 
of course, there's more things and more, um, like I go more in depth in certain things like um, recovery or spousal support. Um, it just all comes full circle. Um, uh, family involvement. Um, like I, I believe that families, when my children go with me to a lot of these classes I do, my family, because um, I think they need to know. They need to know why dad or mom doesn't act this way or doesn't act this way or why um, it's okay not to be okay. So, um, you know, and I'm more than happy to share any resources or anything I have, uh, programs that uh, we've developed, I've uh, developed uh, with anybody that's interested. Okay. Well, Perry, thank you for the, uh, the gift of your time and sharing both of those experiences. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be, it's going to resonate well with the, uh, with the viewers and the listeners to, understand how you got into the position that you did and then how you found a way to work through that and how you're now inspired to help others. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. On behalf of all of our viewers and listeners, thank you, Perry, for the courage to share your experience and your message. Since 2007, Situation Awareness Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and over 65,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If your work is high-risk, high-consequence, and you work in a dynamically changing decision-making environment, then I'm here to improve your safety and your survival and to help you accomplish the most important mission of all. And that's to go home to the ones who love you. I'd like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies and organizations and agencies and departments that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters tour stops for their team members. The Ohio Fire Chiefs Conference in Columbus, Ohio. The Evansville Fire Department in Evansville, Indiana. Fire Rescue International in Dallas, Texas. The Northwest Fire District in Houston, Texas. The Missouri City Fire Department in Missouri City, Texas. And the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in Honolulu, Hawaii. If you're interested in attending one of our upcoming programs, here's where we'll be. September 13th, Eagle Materials in Grapevine, Texas. September 17 and 18, the Odessa Fire Department in Odessa, Texas. September 22, the Columbia Shoe Swap Regional District, British Columbia, Canada. September 24 to 27, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. September 29th, the Badger Firefighter Association in West Bend, Wisconsin. October 12th, the Minnesota Fire Chiefs Association Conference in St. Paul, Minnesota. October 13 and 14, Boggs Run Fire Department in Benwood, West Virginia. October 16th, the University of Ontario Institute of Technology Graduate School Lecture, Toronto, Ontario. October 17, the Association of Canadian Ergonomists Conference, Sudbury, Ontario. October 19th, the Loudoun County Fire Officers Seminar, Loudoun County, Virginia. October 22 to 27, the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, Bremerton, Washington. October 28th, Clearwater Regional Fire Service, Alberta, Canada. And October 29 to November 1, back to the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington. To see the locations of all the upcoming events, head over to the SA Matters website, click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Live Training Dates. If you're interested in hosting a program, just click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the SA Matters website homepage and I'll give you a call. If you want to be part of the SA Matters community of learners, you can do that a couple of ways. Check the show notes to see how you can get connected with us through our newsletter membership, podcast subscribers, YouTube subscribers, and on our social media channels, the Facebook page, the Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking 
and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 228 of the SA Matters show is complete. Thank you to my again to my guest, Perry Hall, for sharing your incredible two-part near-miss story and the aftermath that you have endured. Thank you to our awesome sponsors, Midwest Fire and Chief Miller. Thank you to the companies, agencies, and organizations that have hosted Situational Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to the organizations that have hosted the live, virtual, internet-based training programs. Thank you to the more than 2,000 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.